Hi again, everyone, and welcome back. I know it's been a little while, but welcome back to a brand new episode of Dead Men Talk for a, a, a small batch of episodes that I've decided to call Dead Men Talk Resurrected, uh, mainly because I wasn't sure sort of when I was going to do another series, to be honest, but I'm so pleased to have with me really the guy who was the catalyst for me bringing it back, because when I realised I had the chance to speak to this guy, I couldn't turn it down. Uh, so with me today, I have uh, New York Times best-selling author and a guy who's already on my bookshelf so this is a really really cool moment for me um he's known for his collaborations with a few fairly big names in in sort of the hollywood world so george a romero and my hero guillermo del toro but here to talk about his brand new novel the amazing whale fall i welcome daniel kraus how are you mate i'm doing great i'm doing yeah. great how are you i'm good i'm good thank you all the better for but having you here, really, you know, this is, I say, this is something that I've really been looking forward to because um, Troll Hunters right there mm -hmm. was a birthday or Christmas present for my kids. Oh, uh, cool. A couple, couple of years ago. And I loved it. And then I've, I realized I could I could enjoy it. I could show them it because it was on Netflix as well. It made into a mm -hmm. series. And then I think, I think through following, for the, through looking at this, the beauty of algorithms and that through looking at troll hunters online you start to appear on my feed on instagram right right and it was when i saw what i think probably one of the first pictures you shared of the cover for whalefall mm -hmm. and um brief description of it i was like i need to read that book yeah it, as we'll, we'll delve into this and in, in my my own how this touched on my own loves as well in in certain ways and um so it's fantastic to to have the opportunity to bring you along to uh, to delve into it. Um, just to kind of set the scene, we'll get into this. Okay. We'll get into your obviously whale fall as well. But for the benefit of those who who may not be so familiar with your work or think they're not anyway, um, just give us a brief kind of rundown. Firstly, let's step back in time a little bit mm. to where you first started as a writer. Was it something that? you grew up wanting to be or was it a bit like me was something that just kind of happened accidentally well i did yeah i did grow up wanting to be a writer um though the, the situations in which i grew up didn't make me believe it was really an option yeah. i grew up in a, in the states in the middle of the middle so yeah. just really farmland um small town and i started writing when i was probably you know first grade or something and mm. uh, really uh, never stopped really. But even when I was, you know, 11 or 12 years old and, and really starting to write things of some size, you know, mm. uh, certainly, certainly by that age, writing maybe novellas and by high school writing full on novels, mm. a couple of novels anyway, uh, it still was really something that I did as a hobby and wasn't and I didn't no one even read them I didn't even give them to anyone no. to read they were just something I enjoyed doing um and you know when you grew up in a place like that back you know pre-internet mm. uh you know I didn't know anyone who was a working artist of any sort and I probably didn't even know anyone who knew anyone who was working <laughs> like it was I was so isolated from that kind of thing that I it never really uh was presented to me as a, a viable option, sure. uh, but but that that would have been my dream though had mm. someone asked. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah. So the short answer though is yes. Yeah. That's cool. No, that's cool because I mean, I my mine is, I guess when I think about my own beginnings, whenever anyone asks me that, I remember doing little bits at school, but I really it wasn't something that I thought I was any good at. It wasn't something I really mm -hmm. enjoyed. So I think it's fantastic when I get to talk to people who who they knew they had that in them and they embraced it and they it was something they wanted to do from the off because obviously you know you're living proof that you can make it happen because you have. Um, yeah. When, when yes. did that transition sort of take place? And let's talk about some of your early works that you got published. When was the point at which you felt like you had turned that corner? It's like okay, yeah, this is this is what I am doing. Mm -hmm. professionally now or this is something i definitely can achieve professionally what what was it that took that well years? it was interesting in college i sort of for the first time got away from like i'd always wanted to be a novelist in college um there were 
these film classes. And I, and for some reason, that entered my head as something that was more viable. I don't know why, but because I, I think I began to understand, though, you can work on film crews and you can do the, these various um, jobs. You can hold a boom mic, whatever. Uh, and so I got into sort of filmmaking. I had in high school, I was also making, you know, all these little movies with my friends. And so it was something I was interested in. Mm. And so for largely from college through most of my 20s, that's what I was doing. I was working in film and directing um, mostly documentaries. Okay. And that was um, moderately successful. Like I think um, I was working on very small films, but they they were all, you know, they all played on TV and stuff. So they were like, you know, I was I was doing okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, but I was getting burnt out on it. Like what was happening was uh, a sort of a repeat of what I was talking about when I was a kid where I would, I, would, I really enjoyed doing it and mm -hmm. didn't care if anyone read it or saw it. Yeah. So I started making these documentaries that I, that I really loved, but when it came time to distributing them or broadcasting them, I just had so little interest. I was, I was okay. really still making art just for me. Um, and I think I, that was burning me out. Um, so I, I thought, well, maybe I could go back to my sort of original love. You know, I was still a great big reader and, yeah. um, and essentially what I did, I don't, I have the opposite of a hard luck story. Really. I, <laughs> I wrote a novel and sent it to an agent and he liked it and that was it. And he sold it. And that was my first novel. And, um, I've been this, with the this same. This is agent. the story that all of us writers want to happen. Yeah, it's, but it's, I mean, it's what we think is always going to happen. So that that's true. But I mean, there is a lot of there. There's a you know a tw twelve years in there where I'm doing oh. other stuff, yeah, and during yeah. those twelve years, I'm making a living mostly as a freelance writer. Mm -hmm. So I'm writing for magazines and websites, right. and I really am honing my craft. Like I. So I am I am paying my dues in a way, mm. um, and working really hard. So that when it came time to write a novel, I think had I tried to start a novel like a real novel, you know, straight out of college or something, I wouldn't have had the chops to do it. Yeah. But because I'd really been, you know, some of those some of the magazines I was writing for really required just tons and tons of editing and getting things written down really concisely. Um, and that I think really helped. So yeah. when I finally attempted a novel, um, it had lots of problems, but it was, it was at its core, like pretty decent. Yeah. Um, and it, and I was, I really was lucky. Random house bought it. Um, I think they were the only offer we got. So it was like, wow. Okay. And what was like, do I have? If you've got an offer from someone like that, you don't really. Yeah. Yeah. But it wasn't like there were 10 publishing houses no. vying for it. It was like. No. We struck out, but then got the one, the one hit that we needed. Yeah. Um, so it's yeah. So it all worked out, but it, it it's not quite as perfect and miraculous as it sounds. But again, I think a, a lot a lot of artists can almost lose those years with not seeing that yeah. payoff. I suppose. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's 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 brilliant when you hear those kind of things. Yeah, and I think it's it's a also a reminder to not be afraid to change course. You know, because I had left the idea of writing novels behind for a decade right. um, and had built up this whole other, you know, yeah. semi-decent career. Uh, so when you're suddenly about 30 and deciding to ch completely change waters or 40 or whatever age you're talking yeah. about, yeah. it it it's always a risk to completely throw aside everything you did to, to do something else. Yeah. What was the... What, what was the biggest challenge between the two then i suppose um going from sort of filmmaking back to writing you know did you find that transition yeah. difficult or did you, did you just find um, to do it? one th the thing i liked most about doing the documentaries is that largely i could work alone so um i i don't like working in i, I found out kind of early in the film business i don't really like like working on like large crews and stuff mm -hmm. i liked I really like focusing on things myself. Mm. Uh, so that transferred over really well because in films, you you, you kind of have to work with other people to a certain degree. Yeah. Uh, where writing, you really don't, you know, you're, you're really just alone. And I really am a, an introvert and a hermit. And I like to just sit here at this desk and, 
and right. So in, in a lot of ways, it was ideal. Um, I think it took me four, maybe four books to really get into a routine that felt uh, mm -hmm. successful. You know, I think people's first books are often trial and error and trying to come up with yeah. a procedure that works. Yeah. And there's lots of starting and stopping and completely losing faith and giving up. And I certainly had lots of highs and lows, probably mostly lows. Yeah. Um, until I sort of stumbled upon or graduated into some sort of process that, that worked for me. And once I kind of hit that, hmm. then it... I really became prolific. Like yeah. as soon as it started, everything started clicking in my head, things went much faster. Were you, were you like doing more than one bit of work at the same time or were you fully focused on one at a time before you'd start another? I know uh, that's back hard then, sometimes to kind of, you know, let inspiration park itself for a while. But Back then it was, it was one thing at a time because okay. uh, I think that's all I could handle. And of course I had, you know, full-time jobs and that yeah. kind of thing. <clears throat> um, these days I work on multiple things at once. Mm. Uh, it's very common for a, a single week to go by and I'll, I'll touch upon four or five or six different projects in some way. Mm. Uh, so now there's just many burners with many yeah. things um, cooking on them. Yeah. But I think starting, it was certainly, you know, I'm writing on nights and weekends and stuff. Yeah, so, yeah. so really there's not a lot of time to be spreading things around. And plus, you know, when you're starting out, you got enough trouble just working on one thing. <laughs> yes, I know what that's like. Let's let's move on. If I can just spend a little bit of time just talking about sure. in particular, because I kind of, I need to. First of all, this one here, um, Shape of Water. I mean, we all know the success it has become. Well, those of us that know the work anyway, you know, even people that aren't into, we're, my wife and I are massive fans of Guillermo del Toro's work. Mm. Whenever we see a film coming out with his name on it or a series or anything, we 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 have to watch it. Um, Shape of Water was was quite different, you know. I, I yeah. did see the I, I before I knew it was out there in book form. I did see the movie. This is one probably one of the only times that I've actually gone back to read the book. Yeah. Um, but it was so different from his from his other stuff. And then I found out you were involved in this as well in the novelization yeah. of it. So just talk about firstly as a whole your work with him. How did yeah. that come about? It came about, um, I had written, a, my second book was called Rotters, and it was about this kind of father and son coming of age story about grave robbers that was set in the world of modern day grave robbing. And Gimmer had read it. Um, I mean, it's pretty much that simple. He read it and liked it. And um, he had this property or this idea he was working on that he had sold as a book called Troll Hunters. Yes. Um, and he was looking for a, a co-writer for the book. Um, and I think it was just sort of the right person, at the right time. He had read Rodgers. He thought my skills would sort of apply. Mm. So he got in touch with me for that. And we worked on that. Um, and while we were working on that is sort of, it's become lore now, this, this famous breakfast that he and I had in right. Toronto, because he was up there shooting Pacific Rim, I think. Okay. Yeah, and I came up there and we were talking about pearl hunters and stuff have, over breakfast, and and that's when I mentioned to him how I had this idea for this story that I that I had since I was a little kid uh, that had, that was sort of about a creature from a black lagoon type creature who is captured and then a maid at the facility um, connects with it in some way and breaks it out and puts it in her tub, um, and I. It was always on my list of like books to write, but that's as far as it ever got. Really, what right. I just told you, um, and I, I, the the missing element of it never quite clicked with me. I couldn't quite, I could, I didn't know it was missing. So, years went by, and I really hadn't developed it past that notion. But I knew he liked uh, Creatures from Black Lagoon a lot, so I mentioned it to him, and he just immediately lit up and was like, "Wow, I, this is this is the inroad to this that I've been looking for." Yeah. yeah. Um. So events. So eventually, um, you know, with my interest peaked, I start taking notes for an eventual book. I don't think he's actually going to make the movie. <laughs> it turns out he actually does uh, decide to make the movie. Um, so at that point, we decide to make do the book and the movie sort of simultaneously. Um, they, they come out simultaneously, yeah, more or less. I, I think at the end of the day, the movie came out a little before the book. Okay. Um, 
but but he was shooting the movie while I was writing the book, yeah. and so they were, they were sort of like the only other example that I can think of that's sort of like that is two thousand one, where uh, Arthur C. Clarke was kind of doing the book while Kubrick was doing the movie. It's, it's sort of a, uh, a okay. right. it's a unique process that doesn't happen a whole lot. Were but... you feeding him as you were writing, but were you telling him sort of <laughs> this is what I'm foreseeing? Or, or had you got no. the idea for the film mapped out? You just had to kind of... N no, not really. It was okay. more like I had the initial idea. Yeah. He then turned that into a screenplay. Yeah. Uh, he then shared the screenplay with me and then I meshed that with all the stuff, notes I've been taking for the book. Okay. And sort of, I put those two things together and sort of out came the script so it's it's a weird convoluted process yeah. in a little in a way but um uh unique and interesting and fulfilling certainly so how did how did you feel then seeing the success obviously because it won an academy award for crying out loud, weird so. man it, you know? really weird like i think one of the you know I mean, my like little notebook of ideas it, it's just filled with ideas that i don't think most people would be interested in like right. really unpalatable bizarre ideas and it's it's hard now but the fact of the matter is when when shape of water was just an idea it sounded crazy yeah like it didn't sound like it sounded like no no way would i, I figured the book and movie would be liked i figured that, that the movie would be good you know but i did not expect so many people to embrace it i expected it to be sort of a small art house yeah, movie. I did not expect people to really flip for it, and for so many people, and for just like the average person. Yeah, I thought it was going to be far more niche than that. Yeah. So, but but as soon as it premiered um, in Venice, and I was there, um, it was immediate. Like as soon as the first audiences saw it, there was like this sense that it was big. Yeah. That's 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 that is amazing. It really is. Uh... I think <laughs> as a fan of his stuff, like I say, this 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 movie almost to begin with felt like one of his, but it didn't. It really wasn't what I was expecting at all. Mm -hmm. But I think that's why I loved it in the end. And then you know, I got members of my family who no way are into what I'm into, movie wise, and that, and they they were telling me about it as well. And I was like, yeah, yeah. No, you know, it's right. Like this. So you know, again, it's it's another one of those bucket list items that kind of you've been able to tick off this just mm -hmm. seemed to have happened out of nothing i mean have you still got the notebook with those original notes in somewhere oh yeah they're all they're right here in this drawer <laughs> that's yeah amazing. that's, that's where i keep all my notes for all my ideas up, so you know so anything else in there is, is, is probably pure gold at the moment. yeah they look this is what they look like they're just these little black notebooks <laughs> and you actually use them which is fantastic i've got so many of those around the house with like you know i'm gonna buy another notebook because it's gonna inspire me to write something they're all yeah. still empty. So. Yeah, I got I got a bunch of them. <laughs> as a as a horror fan, I really I should dedicate at least a couple of minutes just to ask you about your collaboration, as it were, with George A. Mm -hmm. Romero as well. Um, it would be rude of me not to. Again, similar kind of thing. How how just tell us sort of your involvement with uh is it the living dead? You were, yeah. yeah, yeah. Your involvement with that, how that came to be. Well, this this was really a dream come true. Um, Ramiro was my favorite artist um, in any medium. Like mm -hmm. he, I saw him at Living Dead when I was probably five or six years old, and just because it was always on TV because of copyright issues, yeah. I saw it just hundreds of times um, over my life, and often as a kid because it was always on TV. Mm -hmm. uh, and really, I think you know I wouldn't be interested in the arts if it wasn't for George Romero and Night Living Dead. Um, his films really guided me and raised me as a as an artist, but also just as a person and someone who, you know, appreciates how art reflects life or vice versa. Yeah. Um, Night of the Dead is sort of my origin story. So to, to be able to be a part of the novel that he was working on when he died, which is sort of the, in a lot of ways, the end of his zombie story that he yeah. began with his films, uh, is just a, still can't believe that I got to be part of that. And, and essentially how that happened was, you know, he died in 2017 and about a month later, um, I got a call from his uh, manager and his uh, wife mm. and um, 
his manager was who I, who I knew a little bit um, was aware of how much I idolized Romero and how much I had really studied his work, not just his zombie movies, but everything. Like I was a real kind of scholar of his stuff. And I had, of course, just come off of the shape of water. Um, So I'd done, I'd, I'd done a couple like successful collaborations Mm. before. Um, So I think that he thought I was just maybe the right guy to, to finish this unfinished epic. Um, And it, it was the, the, the most shocking phone call of my life really. And I spent the next like two years just like work through everything else aside and just dove into this gigantic project um, that involved just massive, massive investigations into George's art and his life um, and his families and his politics and everything. Uh, The pressure on you, obviously, uh, I would imagine insurmountable to, 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 yeah justice to this you know there was pressure a self-applied pressure certainly Mm -hmm. and because i knew that if i if i did well the romero fans would basically i my my thought was they would be like all right george Romero did a great book and if i did poorly (laughs) i would get all the blame (laughs) yeah Uh, so that's kind of what i figured it didn't really pan out that way it was um I think I, maybe until up until whale fall, it's probably my most loved work. I think, I think mm. people really, really um, the feedback I've received anyway has been just That's tremendously good. positive and supportive about that book, living dead. Um, you feel like but, you yeah, I mean, with that, you know, yeah, it could have gone either way. And it could, yeah, you know, but I, I think the only way to progress in pr- projects like that is to convince yourself that you're the right person for the job yeah like you need to have a certain amount of confidence going into it so even if you're lying to yourself you have to like tell yourself that i in in a way i I, in in a way it's true i was saying to myself you've trained all your life for this you know you've been obsessed with george amaro since you know almost before you could walk so you you can do this this is all what you've been getting ready for uh so as long as you if I can just convince myself of that long enough, um, then is it, a, a confident writer is generally a, a better writer. Mm-hmm. So I just told myself that I, I was the right guy for it until I, <laughs> until I was finished. <laughs> and his his stated already earmarked you as they had faith in you anyway. Yeah, to, to bring you in. So yeah, the, working with um, them, particularly Sue's uh, Suzanne, who is his wife, mm-hmm. um, has just been wonderful. She was extremely trusting and giving and um, answered a lot of questions that I had. I went up to Toronto um, t- uh, to, to just, before I started the book, to just like talk to her for a while and try yeah. to get inside George's head a little bit. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the best review I got was from her, you know, just oh, that wow. she loved the book and thought he would have loved the book. And um, job, job done then really, isn't it? Yeah, you nothing. Know, be, anything be else beyond that is a bonus. You know, yeah exactly you, you, exactly uh, that's fantastic right let's 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 move on to obviously one of the reasons we are here and talk about whalefall um i've already said how i discovered it now this really i've got a fascination with man versus beast stories mm-hmm. absolutely love them especially when they involve sea creatures peter benchley steve mm-hmm. alton are amongst my favorite writers you know in that realm so as soon as i saw the cover for whalefall land on my feed just the sheer image um knowing it's something slightly different as well you know there's not many stories out there about sperm whales that i've read except mm-hmm. for the obvious one obviously maybe yeah. um and the fact that you know uh, uh, i'm not going to spoil it too too much i'm going to ask you to kind of sum up what how you would describe the story um mm-hmm. but the the image perfectly perfectly captures the main threat of this this book yeah fantastic yeah the cover is um for those watching in video this is what it looks like so cool. um, the cover cover is good um and i think it it sort of it triggers that sense of i think primordial fear and awe in us both of those things yeah. like had that been just a monster i don't think it would have the power but because we know that that animal's real yeah 
uh, there's something in our brain, the part of our brain that used to be very concerned about being hunted and killed by animals um, when we were early humans, mm -hmm. that part gets jogged when we see images like this. Yeah. And we remember that we're tiny. In Exa some ways. Exactly. Or physically, you know, I bet yeah. if, if there's a whale out there that could really evoke fear, mm -hmm. that kind is definitely them. But this book is really more about awe than it is fear. Yeah. Like I also wanted the cover uh, to both be scary and awesome, like yeah. to provoke this feeling of of real awe at what what the world um, has produced for us, and we don't get to see, and we've kind of forgotten about, like how powerful and tremendous and um, awe inspiring these animals are. Yeah. Um, in, yeah. a nuts, in a nutshell, um, just give us a, a glimpse of what, what is the story about, essentially? Yeah, so, yeah, although it's rooted in, you know, we have whales swallowing people's stories way back in myth and lore and in, in biblical tales. Mm. This is a very modern story. Um, it's about a uh, scuba diver who uh, is swallowed by a sperm whale and has one hour of air left to try to escape the whale. Um, so that's, that's sort of the nutshell version of it. Um, but I, I will say that it's, you know, the book was unique for me in that I, before I could even begin to outline the book, I, I had to learn everything. So I, yeah. I spent maybe three months just interviewing whale experts, whale scientists and diving experts, um, just to get us, I mean, my first question was just, is this even possible? Is there any, yeah. any kind of whale that can swallow a person? That was question one. Okay. And then a million other questions followed. You do hear about it. I've seen a couple in the news, you know, before and since, since I've read the book as well, about divers getting caught yeah. in the mouth. They weren't not necessarily swallowed. I mean, there is one out right. there, I think, recently of a guy who was. But um, there, that yeah, so, alone is terrifying. Yes. So there's a lot of uh, – well, it seems like once every year or two, there's a someone who gets quote-unquote swallowed by a – a whale and it's, it's they're never swallowed no one in known history has been swallowed um that's not to minimize their experience which is what the what they are is they're mouthed by a whale yeah. usually just for a matter of seconds um and then spat out most whales have throats that are about the size of your fist like, there's no way okay. they can actually ever swallow a human okay. the sole exception to that is the sperm whale um okay. that whale has a throat that's that's theoretically big enough to swallow a person they wouldn't want to they wouldn't do it on purpose but oh, yeah. through certain circumstances it is theoretically possible um so yeah anytime there's one of those videos everyone sends it to me and says look it's just <laughs> like your book and i'm like no it's not it's not quite like my book um that just gives you another reason just to confront, promote your book and sort of say no you want oh to totally this, yeah so. i'm thrilled people are making that connection cool. uh, but but it's also an opportunity for education about yeah. just you know like they really only one whale could swallow you. Yeah. So what was the inspiration behind the idea, you know, that came to you that you wanted to write this? Yeah. Well, it's interesting because most of my ideas um, really percolate a long time, as I mentioned with The Shape of Water and lots of my other books. I'll go decades where I'll, I'll stir over ideas. Um, this one was the complete opposite. I had the idea and immediately started working on it. Um, and this was in 2020. Um, there was one of these videos that we're talking about. There was a video of a couple kayakers getting uh, a humpback whale sort of breaches out of the water and kind of lands with its mouth open on a couple of kayakers. And, um, and it was on video. Uh, and so, and that, that, of course, led to a bunch of people saying someone was swallowed by a whale. Once again, they were sort of in the mouth for a few seconds, but still quite terrifying. The video yeah. is, is, is very scary. And I was hanging out with a couple of people in December 2020 and a couple friends and they were they had seen the video and they were talking about it I hadn't seen the video but immediately when they said it, I had this thought of I wonder if anyone's ever taken this idea idea seriously as I mentioned you know the the myth and lore of such a thing is embedded within our sort of human culture but mm. had anyone ever taken it scientifically seriously like what could you survive inside of a whale? So the next morning I got up, I watched the video they were talking about. I started searching to see if anyone had done this before because it seemed like 
surely someone had, uh, but no one had. And then I went on the trail finding whale experts to see if it was even possible. How long did that take to actually research then before you could, or, or unless the research was going on alongside the writing, but how much time did you have to dedicate to talking to these experts before you had a real feel for it? Because the detail in yeah. this, I swore, I could have sworn blind that you had either experienced this or you knew someone who had. Yeah, it's, I would say three months, like okay. I spent, because I had to locate the experts and then I had this very slow process of interviewing them and asking them what was possible. Because I didn't have a plot because I didn't know, I didn't know anything about whales, no. you know? So uh, first question, could they be swallowed? An expert tells me, yes, if you had the right kind of sperm whale and a diver who was like slender enough, maybe. Um, and then I was like, okay, so what would the experience like, what would it, what is the inside of the throat like? So then I'd have to find a throat expert who could really tell me about what the throat's like. And then if you landed in the stomach, what's the stomach like? What does it feel like? How hot is it? Um, what else is in there? Are you underwater or is it sort of dry? Uh, it turns out the stomach is actually how sperm whales chew. So their teeth aren't used for chewing. Their, their stomachs, they smash in with the bone crushing force. And so it was only by these, by questioning them that I even begin to understand what the plot could be. Like what the series of events could be, what all the different ways this diver could try to get out mm. might be, mm. and what would be the challenges of each attempt. Mm. And it's when I, I read initially what the story was about, I mean, you had me at the fact of as a diver that gets swallowed by a whale and he's got an hour to mm. get out, basically. It's like, wow, this is going to be fast paced, there's going to be action all around. <clears throat> and there is. But I think what I wasn't expecting was almost like the symbolism that the the, the um whilst again i'm not going to throw any spoilers out there but whilst he's what he's going through inside the whale and he's struggled to try and get out mm -hmm. he's almost relating to things he's having to battle had to face up to in his own life yeah exactly with, with his dad specifically enough mm -hmm. and it's almost like during the you get a real sense that during those last few months what could be his last few moments mm -hmm. um it's, it's it's a real case of life flashing before your eyes and in the, in the most artistic yeah. ways i would say that you've done that it's fantastic was that was that something that you wanted to do early on or did that naturally kind of unfold as you were writing it trying to sort of you know put the point mm -hmm. to this idea i think yeah i think that's what surprises people about the book is that <laughs> it's very moving um people expect it to be just a thriller and yeah. people end up sobbing their eyes out by the end you know uh I don't know well which point at what point I decided sort of what the alt what sort of the B story is like he's stuck in the whale um but the reason he got swallowed by the whale is he was out looking for the bones of his dead dad um who he was very estranged from uh and who had kind of in the throes of cancer had thrown himself off a, a boat and drowned uh so and his dad was this sort of um, renowned diver of the, the Monterey, California area. Uh, and, you know, tried to drag our main character kicking and screaming as a kid to become another great diver. And the kid didn't want to be um, and had a lot of issues with the dad. And so now that he's inside the whale's stomach and sort of discombobulated by fear and injury and hallucination from the methane inside the, the stomach, he starts seeing the whale as an embodiment of the dad. And he starts almost communicating with the whale as if it were the dad. And, and it, through this process, there's a sort of a reconciliation between the two, mm -hmm. how, the, how the dad and the son both tried, like reached out to one another over the years and how they failed each other over the years and how um, this weird experience in the in the worst you know mm. space possible ends up being kind of a way for them to come to terms with one another mm. um, and and kind of forgive one another and you know for the very palpably that means for mm. the son to remember all the lessons that the dad taught him about whales and the sea and diving mm. that um, if he can remember them heed them now might save his life. And I, 
I'm not just saying this, this was one of the most fascinating reads, I think, because I went into it knowing what I wanted from it. Mm-hmm. And I got so much more, which, you know, those are the kind of books that really do stick with you, especially with me. Um, obvious question, can you know, knowing that some of your other ideas have already been put up there on mm-hmm. screen, do you, do you, could you envisage this one being up there? Yes. Um, I can't, I can't, as you would imagine, can't speak of specifics, but mm-hmm. I will say that there is interest. That, that gets me quite excited. So because if I if there's ever a book I've read which I think played out like a a, a movie or you know a mini series or whatever, this one was perfect. So yeah, I mean there's an obvious challenge to it in the sense that half the book is inside a, yeah. a very small space, to say the <laughs> least. Um but it does have, you know, it has the sort of feel and emotion of something like gravity, I think. Yeah, and it certainly has that. Or 127 hours, like there's there's certain or the Martian. There's there's certain yeah. elements, survival elements of it that intertwine with emotion in a in a way that yeah. if someone can pull it off, it could be pretty tremendous. I was going to say there's some things that I've seen, and I can't for life me remember. I think if it's called Fall, I can't think where it's the the two girls who were climbing. Ah, they yeah, yeah, standard, yeah. That alone, not a very big cast list at all. Not a very big, you know, location mm-hmm. that you needed. But my God, the fear! <laughs> that, yeah, that, that's a great. That's, that's a great example. Feel, you know, is is, and I could totally see it with this one. That you, it's that almost that that claustrophobic feel, um, of being in that tight space and not knowing how the hell you're going to get out of there. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's it's something that really kind of evoke actual emotions rather than just like, oh, this is a, this is a thrilling, scary film mm-hmm. it's just good entertainment I mean, definitely definitely more to that that's 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 good yeah i'm going to keep my eye on that then and uh yeah fingers crossed but um when can we i know the book's not out yet i don't believe when is it uh, due for release it's out in august at august oh boy try that again <laughs> it's out on august 8th uh in the states anyway cool cool, cool. so um anyone out there who's watching this who I'm sure we've grabbed you enough anyway. Um, I, I can't encourage everyone enough to go out and buy this when it's uh, when it's out there. It's, it's, it's such a fantastic read. And again, I know you probably can't you know share too much information. Now, anything else that you've got lined up that you can talk about that you're also working on at the moment, or just yeah, to- I mean, I'm working on a bunch of stuff. Um, I'm looking over here because I kind of got my list. Um, Oddly enough, a bunch of it isn't announced yet. Um, so there's not a lot I can quite talk about yet. But uh, yeah, yeah. I've got sort of an ongoing kids series called Graveyard Girls that's coming out. There's one this year and the one every year for five years. Okay. Uh, and then I have, I do have another novel um, that will be of interest to readers uh, next year, but it's, mm-hmm. it's not, it hasn't really been announced yet. Ah, that's fine. As long as we know that there's more to come, that's that's great. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, a lot more actually. A lot more. Yeah. You're, 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 I don't think you're a very hard guy to find on social media if everyone wants to track you down. But feel free to just let us, let everyone know where they can find you if they want to find out more. Keep up. I mean, really, uh, DanielKraus dot com is the website, and that'll have any kind of other links you need. Cool. That's brilliant. Awesome. Short and sweet. <laughs> I'd say with your yeah. work that's already out there, you're not a very difficult man to track down. Um, listen, Daniel, this has been truly fantastic to get inside your head. I could probably talk to you a lot, lot more, you know, off. I mean, one thing actually I wanted to mention, this is really just an observation, but it's again something else that I that grabbed me about Whalefall is the, the chapter numbers or lack thereof. Mm-hmm. Uh, the way that you split the book up <clears throat> yeah. is, is just like the it's the uh oxygen reading i guess mm-hmm. of what he's got left when it started off i thought there'd almost been a typo or something because like yeah. each chapter starts off 3000 psi i thought well, this is a bit odd and then it ticks down and down and down and that when you get to a chapter and you you already know you can almost compute the difference between where this guy was between the last chapter and now yeah i really like that idea of using the oxygen reading for chapter titles. Yeah, and yeah. that really that helped lead me to making the chapters really short um yeah, yeah typically i tend to write kind of longer chapters but in this one the chapters are all like two pages i mean they're really mm-hmm. short mm-hmm. and part of that was i wanted to um 
I really wanted to communicate how quickly the error was, he was yeah. losing the error. Yeah. And, and once, and that sort of led to short chapters and the short chapters then fed into the rhythm of the flashback. So it all yeah. sort of worked together. Yeah. Um, you get a real sense of panic for those short chapters. Don't you really? Yeah. There's, a, there's almost a lot happening and there would be sort of mentally, you know, if you're in that situation, your, your brain would be going in all directions, you know, misfire. Exactly. Really yeah. It feels, yeah. yeah, it feels, it feels panicked. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. There we go. I, I wanted to make sure I got that in there. because okay. <laughs> Anyway, Daniel, thank you so, so much for your time and all the best with uh, Whalefall when it comes out. Can't wait to see what else lies ahead for that one and, and everything else that you've got coming out. And, um, you know, hopefully we can do this again sometime, you know, down the road to, uh, to have a chat about um, whatever lies ahead for you, mate. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for being on Dead Men Talk. It's been an honor. Hey, honors all mine. Thank you so much. No worries. Thank you, mate. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to like, share and hit the subscribe button. Also follow us on Facebook and Instagram to keep updated about all future shows.